Hey there, I'm Bill and welcome to Project Build, where today we're back in the kitchen cooking up these faux marble counters. So there are going to be two main parts to this build, and the first is going to be actually making kitchen counters. I'm in the middle of a never-ending kitchen renovation, so I don't have existing counters to work with. And the second part of the build is going to be painting the counters and putting epoxy on top to make them look like marble. And this is a pretty popular DIY project that you can do if you have existing counters already. Before we get into actually making the counter for the island, I wanted to cover the various measurements of the counters. And I've got an unpainted counter here to help with understanding these measurements. The standard overhang for counters can vary a bit, but it's typically between one to one and a half inches at the front of a cabinet and about half an inch on any exposed edge with no overhang at the edge of a counter that meets a wall or an appliance like this stove. I decided on a one and a quarter inch overhang at the front of the cabinet. So there's a half inch to the front of the three quarter inch thick drawer face here and a half inch overhang on any exposed edge of the cabinet. I also put a three quarter inch thick wood edge on every exposed end of the counters. So I'll need to subtract those from the total size of the counters to get the measurements I need to cut the plywood to for each one. And these countertop measurements should all make a little more sense as I make this island counter. So let's get to work. I started by ripping a half inch sheet of plywood to size for the island counter and then a three quarter inch sheet to that same size. We'll create our inch and a quarter thick counter by laminating the two sheets together. To do this, I laid the three quarter sheet face down and added a whole bunch of extended open time wood glue to the back side. Using this glue gives me the time I need that normal wood glue does not to spread out the glue and cover the whole surface. I needed a way to spread the wood glue as quickly as possible as even with the extended open time glue, I was really fighting the clock. I discovered that a rubber pet hair cleaning brush is basically a giant version of the little wood glue brush I use all the time, so I tried that out and it worked really well. I used the brush to spread the glue and then added more glue in the areas that needed it and continued spreading it out until the entire surface was covered. Then I got some help to lift the half inch sheet over on top of the three quarter inch sheet, quickly line them up, and clamp the corners in place. To hold the sheets together while the glue dries, I screwed through the half inch layer into the three quarter inch layer using one inch washer head screws. And I screwed these in a grid about a foot apart at first, and then came back and added more screws to fill in the spaces in between. I let the glue dry overnight and then removed the screws the next day. The half inch plywood layer wasn't perfectly aligned with the three quarter layer so I used a flush trim router bit with the bearing running against the three quarter layer to trim all the sides. Next, I needed to make the sink cutout for my island. And this was kind of confusing to get the measurements right. So to check myself, I clamped one of the cutoff strips of plywood from earlier in place where the actual counter was gonna be and marked the edges of the inside of the sink as well as the depth from the back of the sink. And I transferred these sink marks to the top of the counter and measured over 3 eighths of an inch towards the outside edges of the island and marked my area to cut out with a drywall square. I'll talk more about why I moved those marks out 3 eighths of an inch later. I used a straight edge to make the two cuts into the island and then plunge the circular saw down to the counter against the straight edge and follow that straight edge to connect the cuts. I clamped the support board underneath the front of the cutout and used my jigsaw to complete the corner cuts as the circular saw doesn't cut as far at the bottom of the counter. And then I washed the sawdust off my hand, but they still felt dirty afterwards for some reason. With the island base done, I started making the wood edging for it. So I ripped wood into one and a quarter inch strips on the table saw. I'm using three quarter inch thick maple that I got from my local hardwood store as it's a pretty durable wood and it paints really well. When I built the island, I intended for the counter to be 97 and a half inches long so that a 96 inch sheet of plywood plus the two three quarter inch thick edges would make the perfect link counter. But I messed this up somewhere along the way and I actually made the island about an inch and a half too long. So to fix this, I first added a strip of 3 quarter inch maple at each end of the island. I attached the strips by adding wood glue to the back side, spreading it out with my small wood glue brush and tacking it in place with my brad nailer using one and a half inch brads. So the edging is intentionally slightly oversized so I can flush trim it with the top and bottom of the counter. I clamped a board in place to make a wider support edge and then ran the router along the bottom to trim it flush. 
and then I repeated for the top edge. With the counter length extended, I cut 45 degree miters into the ends of my edging, again adding wood glue to the back sides, and used a scrap cutoff to set the mitered corner correctly and tacked it in place. The brad nailer very quickly reminded me why we never put our free hand anywhere near the path of the nail, and I fixed these mistakes by cutting the brads off flush with the moldy tool and knocking the brads down with a nail set. And then it's just doing the same thing to add the rest of the wood edging, except for the edging around the sink. That's a bit different. I secured the outside corners with one inch long brads, two near the outside edge, and then one from the other direction in the middle. And I mentioned that the edging for the sink cutout is different. I need to be able to route this flush with the edge of the sink, which means no brads allowed. I glued the wood edging and secured it in place using washer head screws, pre-drilling the holes before putting the screws in. And after a night of drying, I removed all the screws, then I flipped the counter over and flush trimmed all the bottom edges. It's much easier to do this flush trimming from above where you can see what you're doing. I had some spots where the router dug into the edging, so I filled those with wood filler and then sanded them once they were dry. I also added a 1 8 inch round over to the bottom edge of the counter on all the edges except for those around the sink. With the bottom side of the edging done, I once again flipped the counter over and then trimmed the edging flush with the top of the counter. The edging for the sink cutout is a little different as we have inside corners here and the router can't go all the way into those corners. To get these inside corners flush, I flipped over a wide chisel so the beveled side was down and cut the wood flush with the top by keeping one edge of the chisel against the top of the plywood. If you keep the chisel at a fairly shallow angle, it shouldn't be able to cut anything below the surface of the plywood. And this worked pretty well, but I am curious if anyone knows of a better technique to flush trim an inside corner edge like this. Now it was time to fit the counter to the sink. I put painter's tape on the top edge of the sink to protect it from scratches, and then got some help moving the counter on top of the island. I moved the counter into position, checking that I had the appropriate overhang, about one and a quarter on the front edge and a half inch on the other three, and clamped the counter in place. I screwed it down at various points near the sink, going up through the bottom of the cabinet stretchers using one and a half inch washer head screws. This both serves to hold the counter down against the top of the sink and gives us reference points for realigning the counter later. I began routing away the wood edging, but it quickly became apparent that the plastic I had put in the sink to cover the drain was going to be a problem, so I stopped before it pulled into the bit, which could have been really bad, and just covered the drains with painter's tape instead. I resumed routing the edge, making multiple shallow passes, until the wood edge was flush with the edge of the sink below. Routing this edge flush is why we made the sink cut out 3 8 of an inch wider in each direction earlier. It allows the wood edging to overlap the sink edges while still having enough wood left over to add a round over to it. There are three kinds of sink reveals for undermount sinks, positive, negative, and zero reveals, and each has pros and cons. So what I'm doing here is creating a zero reveal where the edge of the counter is flush with the edge of the sink. And this is considered the nicest of the three reveals, but typically has the downside of being the most expensive to fabricate since it requires high precision to cut a stone counter that way. But we can pull it off here since these aren't actually stone counters. I removed the counter and took it back to the shop and clamped a board in line with the routed edges to allow me to finish routing both at the back and the sides of the sink. Next, I filled all the imperfections of the counter with wood filler including any gouges in the wood edging, the seams between the edging and the plywood, the brad holes, and the mitered corners. Once dry, I sanded it all smooth with 150 grit sandpaper on my orbital sander. I added a hole for the faucet in the middle of the sink cutout by first drilling a pilot hole all the way through the counter and then drilling up halfway through the bottom with the 1 and 3 8 inch hole saw and finishing the hole down through the top. This hole is set back two and a half inches from the counter edge, which allows it to clear the metal sink underneath the counter. And then I sanded the entire counter with 220 grit sandpaper to prepare it for painting. We're almost ready to paint this counter, but first I needed to add a profile to the wood edges. And I chose to go with a simple 1 8 inch round over, commonly referred to as an eased edge, as I like the cleanness and simplicity of it but you can totally choose to route whatever counter profile you want here. Lastly, I hand sanded the rounded over edges to blend them into the rest of the edging, and now we're ready for paint. 
All right, I brought the counters inside into my paint room and now I'm ready to actually paint them and make them look like marble. So when I first started planning this project, I priced out the materials, paint, brushes, rollers, epoxy, etc., that I was gonna need to paint these counters versus using one of the pre-made kits that was out there. And what I found was that buying everything separately wasn't really that much cheaper than using one of the pre-made kits. So I decided to go the pre-made kit route and I think that's really gonna be the easiest option for most people. After some research, I chose the Gianni Marble Epoxy Countertop Kit and I reached out to them and they were kind enough to actually send me a kit which was super awesome. So thanks Gianni. I linked the kit as well as all the other tools and materials used in this video down in the video description so that you can check them out there. Gianni has detailed instructions that come with this kit as well as a how-to video that you can check out if you end up going this route. So I'm not gonna go into every small detail, but I will show you what I did and highlight any small improvements or tips that I found along the way. All right, let's make these wood counters look like marble. Before painting, I wiped the entire counter down with a tack cloth to remove any wood dust left from sanding and then applied the first coat of the white base with a foam roller on the sides and top. I also rolled the bottom edge on this first coat just to make sure I got full coverage of the bottom round over. In total, it took four coats of the white base to keep the wood edging from showing through the white and if I were to do it over, I'd paint the wood edging with a concealing primer and then put two to three coats of white over the whole counter. I started my work on the marble veins by planning a rough sketch of what the flow of the marble veins should follow as they are painted on and then went about getting all the paint ready. I deviated from the instructions for this next part. The kit only comes with one color gray for the marble veins, but I found it too dark for my liking so I mixed together three separate colors instead. I took the included paints and mixed them to create a light gray that's one part gray and two parts white, a medium gray that's two parts gray and one part white, and a dark gray that's two and a half parts gray with a little bit of a dark gray mixed in from a paint I had left over from an old project. I also added one part water to each color to dilute the paint and help achieve the blurred underwater look that marble veins have. This beautiful hand model here is my wife Brady, as in our testing we learned that she is just much better at painting the veins than I was. So take it away Brady. Okay. So I painted a short distance of a wavy thin line of the lightest gray paint with a brush provided, making sure to wrap it over the end of the counter and then misted it lightly with a spray bottle. I blur the paint with a cheap makeup brush, pinching the bristles to keep the paint from spreading out too much. Bill and I found this makeup brush worked better than the one included in the kit as it did a better job of blurring the paint without leaving behind obvious brush marks. I continued the vein using the medium gray paint Bill mixed earlier, just like I painted the first. Paint it on, spray it lightly with water, and blur it with the brush. Using the medium gray here helps to emulate the subtle, natural variations in color that real marble veins have. I continued the vein on, again with a medium gray, and on this one I blurred it a little wider than I wanted to, so I wiped away the smudges while it was still wet. I switched back to the light gray here to finish the vein out. That's one vein down and plenty more to go. To paint a wider vein, I started with a few lines and blurred them out. And I continued to add more paint lines and blur them into the existing vein until I got the thickness I was looking for. Once I painted all the veins and they were dry, I came back and added darker highlights to the veins using the medium and dark grays Bill mixed, arbitrarily painting small dots and lines and then blending them into the existing vein. These dark accents help to add randomness and depth to the veins. After the accents were done, I used the lightest gray to add random wispy veins that branch out from the primary veins. These are more subtle, some are barely even visible, but they continue to add more depth and dimension to the counters. Now that all the veins are painted, I used a piece of the included sponge to dab on a little of the white highlight paint and blurred it with a makeup brush. This furthered the underwater effect of real marble that we are trying to achieve. And with that, my time here is done. Back to you, Bill. Well, let's see how Brady did compared to our expectation Patronum. I, for one, think it looks awesome. The paint is done, so now we'll prep for the epoxy. I put painter's tape just inside the bottom edge all the way around the counter so that we have a way to remove the dripping epoxy later. Then I lightly sanded the entire counter with 600 grit sandpaper to smooth everything out. Be really careful sanding the edges and corners. It's very easy to sand all the way through the paint there. Ask me how I know. 
and then I wiped off all the sanding dust with a tack cloth. The epoxy in the Gianni kit comes in three sets and each set covers about 12 square feet. I used a measuring tape to figure out where 12 square feet extended to and marked this spot with painter's tape for reference as well as the next 12 square foot section and now we're ready to make this counter shine. I poured the can of epoxy activator into the can of resin and then set a timer and stirred it for 3 minutes and 30 seconds, being sure to scrape the sides and bottom of the can with the mixing stick. This starts the curing process so we're really on the clock from here on. I poured the epoxy on the counter across my first 12 square foot section and then started lightly rolling it out, trying to make sure I covered everything evenly. Now I'm not worried about getting it level here, just that I cover every area of the counter as the epoxy self levels as it sits. I found that covering the top of the counters was pretty straightforward, but it was more difficult to get a consistent and solid layer on the edges, so what worked best for me was to roll the edge first to make sure it was all covered somewhat, and then to pull the roller down over the front edge, which brings a lot more epoxy there than just rolling across it alone. While I was rolling out the first can, Brady was mixing the next set, and then from here, it's the same thing, pouring it on and rolling it all out, blending it into the previous rolled area. And then again for the last section, applying a proportionate amount for the remaining square footage. After about an hour, I came back and removed the painter's tape from the bottom edge. This removes most of the drips from the epoxy running over the edge, but it was super messy, so be sure to wear gloves on both hands, or you're gonna be spending a while cleaning your hand later. Not that I would know anything about that. After 24 hours, the epoxy is mostly set up, but it's still fairly soft, so it was a good time to trim off any remaining drips with the utility knife. This is really just a visual thing for the edges that overhang the cabinets, but it is important for the edges that are on top of something else, like the edges around the sink cutout where the counter will rest on top of the sink. My island has a large overhang, so I wanted to add some extra support here. I'm using these metal brackets made for stone counters to do that, and I need them to be flush with the top of the island. So I first marked the midline of each bracket location, and measured over half the width of the bracket from this midline with my speed square, and then used the bracket to mark the other side. I put some double sided tape on the back of some scrap wood strips, and aligned them with my lines to create a pattern for my router to follow, though I just screwed these strips down for the rest of the brackets, since the screw holes are going to be covered by the counter. And then I made several shallow passes with a pattern bit on my router until the pocket was the same depth as the bracket. You'd normally use some kind of adhesive to attach stone counters to these brackets, but I'm planning to screw my counters in place, so I center punched two holes in each bracket, one near the end and another further in towards the island edge, and drilled them out on my drill press. A quick tip to deburr metal holes is to spin a larger diameter drill bit by hand around the hole. To install the bracket, I lined up the back edge with the side of the 2x4 and marked the holes. Then I center punched and pre-drilled them. I drove the included screws in with my impact driver, but the one where the knot in the wood was did not want to go in, so I removed it and drilled the hole slightly larger. The last thing we want to do here is snap one of these screws off. And I did the same thing for the other brackets until I had four evenly spaced supports. I also added these small mending braces at the corners of the island to give me a way to attach and hold down the corners of the counter. It's been 48 hours since applying the epoxy, so it's time to install the counters. Brady helped me move the island counter into position using the sink cutout as a guide. I lifted the counter and shimmed it up on both sides of the sink using some scrap strips of plywood and then put a bead of caulk on top of the sink that will create a water seal when the counter is lowered down. I screwed through the cabinet stretchers near the sink using the same holes from earlier when I routed the sink cutout to make sure everything was aligned properly and pulled the counter down tight against the sink, and removed any caulk squeeze out with a wet finger and a paper towel. I screwed up into the counter through the rest of the cabinet stretchers as well as my corner mending braces and overhang support brackets. Once the counter was fully attached, I returned to the sink and filled the gap between the sink and the counter pushing the caulk in with a wet finger and cleaning off any extra with a paper towel. And now it's just the finishing touches. I added a faucet because having water at the sink seemed like a good idea, some stools for the overhang, as well as installing the other small counters in my kitchen. I'll need to wait 7 days post application of the epoxy for them to fully cure, and I can't wait to use them. And we're done making the counters. And I'm super happy with how they turned out, but I'm also just really excited to actually have real counters now. 
you want to make counters like these, all the tools and materials I used are linked down in the video description. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and let me know if you have any questions down in the comment section and I'll be happy to help out. If you're not already a subscriber, please consider doing that. If you want to see more projects like this one, be sure to check out my other videos. Thanks for watching and until next time, go build yourself.